the morning at 7 Eastern on C-SPAN. The U.S. Senate is returning from their lunch recess to continue debate on small business legislation. But first, maiden speeches from Senators Dan Coats and Rob Portman. And now to live coverage of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. My colleagues, what is the same here in the Senate uh, on return? Uh, there's also much that has changed in our country and that uh, I think will mandate change in this institution. It's what has changed that has brought me back to the Senate because the more that I witnessed what was happening to our country, the more I realized that I, like many others across the country, needed to re-engage in some way or another in the task of returning our nation to its basic values and time-tested principles. Not the least of which, I think, is returning our federal government to one that ensures a healthy fiscal nation whose finances and policies promote job opportunities for its citizens. I just could not uh, get comfortable with the fact that my generation might be the first generation to turn over a country in worse fiscal shape and with less opportunity to our children than one that we had the privilege of inheriting. When I first came to Congress in 1981, one of the very first votes that I had to deal with, and it was a tough one, it was to raise the national debt limit to the one, just over the one trillion dollar mark. Think of that, for nearly 200 years, as our country prospered and grew, grew financially, uh, we spent and into debt one trillion dollars worth of debt. Now, as a newly elected member, member of the House of Representatives, the last thing I wanted to do was, uh, particularly having run on, the cam on a campaign of limited government and trimming the size of government and spending, to then make one of my very first votes, one to raise the national debt to accommodate excessive spending. On the uh, almost impossible to say no request of then the newly elected President Ronald Reagan, who said we need to pay the past bills so that we can get to the job of cutting spending and cutting taxes and getting our country back on the right tra track economically. And so I gritted my teeth and swallowed hard and made that first vote. It is difficult for me today to comprehend that I'm standing here just 30 years later and we are looking at a national debt of over fourteen and a half trillion dollars. So in just thirty years we've gone from one trillion to fourteen and a half trillion. I cannot comprehend that number. I think very few Americans can comprehend that number. But clearly one thing stands out and that is that this federal government has grown faster and much deeper into debt than any of us could have possibly imagined and over a very short period of time. It's, we have paid a steep and will pay an even steeper price tag for that debt. And it threatens our way of life as well as our nation's security. During the 90s, uh, the combination of economic growth that defeated the 1993 health care plan, President Clinton's decision to move to the middle and support welfare reform all contributed to moving us toward a more sensible and fiscally responsible balance between revenue and spending. In fact, in 1998, we actually reached a surplus uh, of about $69 billion, the first surplus reached since the year 1969. That would have been the ideal time to lock in a balanced budget amendment to ensure and hold Congress uh, that this would, uh, we would not slip back into deficit spending and that Congress and the White House would be held accountable for future spending. You know, there were two serious attempts during the 90s, uh, both of which I supported, uh, to enact a balanced budget amendment. Uh, they failed, each one, by one vote. Think today where we would be fiscally. Had we passed, had we gotten that one vote and passed either of those amendments, sent it to the states for ratification, which I'm sure they would have done, we would not be facing the dire fiscal situation that we face today. I have decided not to go into the details of our exploding deficits and debt. Much has already been said and published in that regard. Much has been said on this floor and more will be said. But based on the last election, uh, the American public is now much better informed of our current financial uh, situation 
and the dangerous consequences of spending beyond our means. We have spent beyond our means in all areas of government. We have increased unfunded liabilities and we have committed to programs which we cannot afford or sustain. Americans have heard the warnings of many who have analyzed our situation and sounded the alarm and in 2010 said immediate action must be taken to avoid a national fiscal crisis of unprecedented negative consequences. What are those consequences? Ultimately, those consequences are a lower standard of living, less income for families to take home, to pay the mortgage, to buy that new car, to send their children, save and money to send their children to school. Those consequences have unfortunately over the past couple of years put our nation in a serious unemployment situation. People are out of work and they've been out of work for months if not years. Ultimately it all turns down to jobs. Having the ability to bring home earnings that will sustain a family and provide opportunities for education, health, growth for those families and give our children and our grandchildren and all those who follow us the opportunities that so many of us have enjoyed. Those are the consequences we face if we don't today address these problems. Many respected economists and financial experts have continued to issue dire warnings about our current fiscal condition and let me quote just a couple. Erskine Bowles, the former chief of staff to President Clinton and co-chair of the President's Deficit Reduction Committee uh, said, this debt is like a cancer that will destroy the country from within unless Washington acts. Pete Peterson, former U.S. Secretary of Commerce and Finance Executive said this about the national debt. We need to ask ourselves, not just is this sustainable, but is it moral? What does it mean to burden our children to an unconscionable doubling of their taxes? Admiral Mullen, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of our military said, I believe our debt is the greatest threat to our national security. If we as a country do not address our fiscal imbalances in the near term, our national power will erode and the cost of our ability to maintain and sustain influence could be great. And finally, former U.S. Controller General David Walker, who served under both Republican and Democrat administrations, has said, and I quote, what threatens the ship are large, known, and growing structural deficits. Habitually spending more money than you make is irresponsible. But that is exactly what Washington has done. Habitually spend, sinking our fiscal ship deeper and deeper each year. We saw a drastic swing, as I have mentioned in November. Hoosiers and, and Americans uh, united together in a common purpose demanding that our newly elected representatives and all representatives repair our fiscal health that's been destroyed by excessive tax and spend policies. They called for a change in course. They called for bold action today to preserve our country for tomorrow. They realized that the stakes are too high to ignore or delay addressing our fiscal challenges. Hoosiers, fam Hoosier families and businesses, local communities, States and virtually every other entity across Indiana and across our country have had to make sacrifices to trim their budgets. They are now calling for the federal government and for Congress to do the same. But Mr. President, we cannot succeed unless we together, Republicans and Democrats, agree that addressing our current fiscal crisis requires political courage and bold action from both parties both chambers of commerce, of Congress, and President Obama. Mr. President, I'd like to offer what I think are some solutions that I believe Congress must execute, perhaps in a coordinated way, essential steps if we are serious about addressing the fiscal challenge before us. First, stop the fiscal bleeding and avoid economic distress by doing so. Washington has to break its habit of spending and borrowing addiction. Like curing any bad habit, it'll take discipline and it'll take commitment. As, as we consider, consider spending cuts and ways we can reverse the growth of government, I believe everything must be on the table. All functions of government should be examined 
including mandatory spending and defense spending. Serious discussions and proposals are currently underway in this Congress. I'm participating in many of them. These proposals need to be considered carefully, they need to be debated, and they need to be voted on. Secondly, I think it's important that we recognize that spending cuts alone will not solve our fiscal challenges and preserve our future. We need to pair our cuts with a pro-growth agenda that puts Hoosiers and Americans back to work. One of the ways Congress can achieve this goal is by reforming the tax code. By lowering marginal rates, by lowering corporate rates to make us more competitive with our competitors around the world, by eliminating exclusions and special interest deductions and credits, and simplifying the complex and convoluted tax code, Congress can help advance the economic recovery. This, I believe, is a necessary element in the task of returning to fiscal health. I currently am working on legislation on this very topic and hope to introduce it in coming weeks. Third, Washington needs to examine, reduce, and in many cases, eliminate harmful regulations and mandates. As I've traveled across Indiana, perhaps one story that I've heard over and over and repeats itself with every business I participate with or engage with, the, the word is regulations coming out of Washington, many of which do not reflect the will of the people, the will of Congress, but are imposed by non-elected bureaucrats, have put us at a disadvantage with our competitors, have added additional burdens of paperwork and compliance to us, and don't make sense from a health and safety standpoint. So oversight and proposals to address the regulatory burdens also need to be considered, debated, and voted on by this Congress. Fourth, I think we need to promote trade policies. 6,000 businesses in Indiana export overseas. One-fourth of all of our manufacturing jobs result from exports. So a good first step in all this process is to open our markets by approving the three pending trade agreements that we have, Korea, Colombia, and Panama. This will increase job opportunities at home, and this will put us on the path of continuing open trading that provides so many jobs to so many Hoosiers and so many Americans. Mr. President, having said all this, the greatest threat to our fiscal security is the growing and unsustainable mandatory spending. We cannot strengthen our country's financial health without addressing Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. These programs consume nearly two-thirds of the federal budget. And while we hear a lot of talk about the necessity of tackling entitlement spending, little action occurs because it's often considered too politically dangerous. However, I believe we no longer have a choice. We no longer can defer addressing these problems until after the next election. The entitlement crisis is before us and has been growing for several years. We know about the coming baby boom generation that's retiring and the impact it will put on these entitlement programs. And we have to commit, I believe, to finding a way to restructure these programs and make them solvent. Let me repeat that. We're not here to undercut these programs. We are here to preserve those programs. We are here to make the necessary structural long-term incremental changes so that those benefits will be there for people when they retire. As Winston Churchill once said, one ought never to turn one's back on a threatened danger and try to run away from it. If you do that, he said, you will double the danger. But if you meet it promptly and without flinching, you can reduce the danger at least by half. We have not met this promptly, but I believe it's not too late to begin the process of making common sense adjustments to the current systems. Modest incremental changes now will help us avoid much more drastic and painful changes later. In 1983, the Congress was faced with a serious Social Security crisis. We were months away from having checks not sent out. Together, President Reagan, Tip O'Neill, majority and minority members of the Senate and the House, and the political leaders of the respective parties gathered together and decided to put this issue and the solution to this issue above politics. And they did so. 
and it was a difficult debate and discussion, but we made changes that were implemented on an incremental basis. Social Security bought 30 years of solvency on the basis of that decision. The sky did not fall, uh, the economy did not collapse, and the people, when they learned why we were doing what we were doing, to preserve the program, not leave it in a dire situation where benefits would have to be cut or reduced dramatically, they backed what we, what we did and supported. I believe we're in that position now with our entitlements. So if we can propose sensible, modest changes that will save these programs, I think the public will gladly uh, support that. Mr. President, over the last decade, we have watched the storm clouds gather. And we've watched as those fiscal clouds have drawn ever closer and become ever darker. They are now bearing down upon us, and alarms are sounding louder than ever. As I have said, it is incumbent upon each of us in this Congress to acknowledge that the storm is here and to do all we can to mitigate the damage. But given the current division of authority in our Congress and executive branch, it is incumbent upon the two chambers and the two parties to succeed if we're going to set aside, if we're going to address this current situation. It's incumbent if we, to, to succeed that we will need to set aside the politics of 2012 for the future of our nation. And I believe the voters will respond favorably to that decision. However, no matter what we do as elected representatives, we cannot ultimately succeed without the engagement and the support and the leadership of the President of the United States. We know that the President understands the gravity of the fiscal crisis. As a former Senator, as a presidential candidate, and now as Commander-in-Chief, he has clearly articulated his understanding of the issue. In 2006, then-Senator Obama said, and I quote, increasing America's debt weakens us domestically and internationally. Leadership means that the buck stops here. Instead, Washington is shifting the burden of bad choices today onto the backs of our children and grandchildren. America has a debt problem and a failure of leadership. Those are the words of former Senator Barack Obama, now President of the United States. As a candidate for President in 2008, President Obama said, we've, we're going to have to take on entitlements, and I think we've got to do it quickly. And in 2009, then President Obama said, what we have done is kick this can down the road. We are now at the end of the road and are not in a position to kick it any further. He also promised his administration would, quote, work with Congress to execute serious entitlement reform. Now, President Obama, as both Republicans and more and more Democrat members of Congress are committing to go forward, and as Republican and Democrat governors of states in fiscal peril are responding, our nation, Mr. President, our nation needs you now to assume the primary leadership role in helping us avert these financial problems and potential financial meltdown. The 2012 election must be subordinate to the urgency of the challenge before us. We cannot afford to wait until 2013 to begin the necessary work to prevent a fiscal disaster. We need presidential leadership now. Our country's future is at stake. Given the immensity of our fiscal challenges that we face today, some would say it's too late to remedy the problem. I do not hold that view. And I don't hold that view partly because and primarily because of our nation's history in rising to the challenge that faces us. From the founding fathers to George Washington, from Abraham Lincoln to Roosevelt and Reagan, times of trial and crisis have always produced moments of great leadership and the response of the American people to support that leadership. And that is what Americans are yearning for today, leadership. Leadership to guide us out of this dangerous financial hole that threatens our nation's security and future. So I ask our president, as other presidents throughout our history have done in times of major threats, 
Mr. President, grant us your leadership. Grant us the leadership needed to restore the strength and prosperity that has been the American story and has allowed our nation to be the defenders and protectors of democracy and freedom. Thirty years ago, Ronald Reagan delivered his first inaugural address and expressed the urgent need to rein in spending and curb the size and growth of the federal government. He said, doing so will require our best effort and our willingness to believe in ourselves and to believe in our capacity to form great deeds, to believe that together with God's help, we can and we will resolve the problems that confront us. For each of us serving here today, I believe it is our duty to rise to the immediate challenge and resolve the problems which now confront us. It will take all of us uniting behind a common purpose that above all else, we must first restore and strengthen our fiscal security. We must articulate a clear vision, set specific goals, and make the tough decisions needed to bring our nation out of debt and preserve prosperity and opportunity for future generations. I am here today to commit to Hoosiers, to my colleagues, to my children and grandchildren, to all our nation's children and grandchildren, that I will not turn my back on our economic dangers or seek the false safety of political denial. I am standing here today to find solutions, to make the hard decisions, and leave behind a country that is stronger and more fiscally secure for future generations. This crisis is not insurmountable. We can overcome it by doing what great generations before us have done, mustering our will to do what's right. If we do, I know that America's greatest days are not behind us, but still lie ahead. Mr. President, I yield the floor. The Republican leader. Mr. President, not often in life <clears throat> does someone get a second opportunity to make a good first impression. The senator from Indiana has had a chance to make two maiden speeches in the Senate. I confess I was not there for the first one, but I'm pleased to have been there for the second one. And I want to commend him for his extraordinary speech, particularly his emphasis on the importance of the President of the United States leading on the issue of entitlement reform. We all know that under the Constitution, only the President's signature can make a law. And I think what Senator of Indiana has pointed out, and many others have pointed out, is that on the issue of entitlement reform, the 50, over $50 trillion of unfunded liabilities we have laying out there ahead of us, promises we've made we cannot keep, this cannot be done without presidential leadership and a presidential signature. And I thank the sen Senator from Indiana for reminding us all of that. And we all still hope that the President will step up and help us meet this enormous challenge. And I commend the Senator from Indiana for a wonderful first impression. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland. Mr. President. Mr. President, Senator will seek recognition to offer some amendments. I would ask unanimous consent that after Senator Vitter has offered his amendments that I be recognized for up to 10 minutes as if in morning business. Is there objection? Senator from Oklahoma. Uh, if you would amend your request that at the conclusion of your remarks that you'd return to amendment number 183. Does a senator so amend his remarks? I think the senator was distracted uh, over there. If you would amend your, remar your uh, unanimous consent request so that we would return to amendment number 183 at the conclusion of your remarks. Could I uh, suggest the absence of a quorum for one moment, please? Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
for her. All right. Mr. President. Sir, from Oklahoma. Ask unanimous consent that the quorum call in progress be vitiated. Is there objection? Without objection, sir. Now you have the floor to the senator from Maryland. Uh, Mr. President, I ask that I be able to speak as if in morning business. Is there objection? Without objection, sir. Uh, Mr. President, I rise today to share my thoughts on the hearings held last week in the House of Representatives called the extent of radicalization in the American Muslim community and that community's response. Congressional hearings are supposed to serve as an important role of oversight, investigation, or education, among other purposes. However, this particular hearing, billed as a first of a series, served only to fan flames of fear and division. My first concern is the title of the hearing, targeting one community. That is wrong. Each of us have a responsibility to speak out when communities are unfairly targeted. In 1975, the United States joined all the countries of Europe and established the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, now known as the OSCE. The United States Congress created the U.S. Helsinki Commission to monitor U.S. participation and compliance with these commitments. The OSCE contains commitments in three areas or baskets, security, economics, and human rights. Best known for its human rights advancements, the OSCE has been aggressive in advancing these commitments in each of the OSCE states. The OSCE stands for religious freedom and protection of minority rights. I am the Senate Chair of the U.S. Helsinki Commission. In that capacity, I have raised human rights issues in other countries, such as in France, when in the name of national security, the Parliament banned burqas and wearing of all religious articles, or when the Swiss restricted buildings of mosques or minarets. These policies were restrictive not only to the religious practice of Muslims, but also Christian, Jews, and others who would seek to wear religious symbols and practice their religion as they saw fit. I have also raised human rights issues in the United States when we were out of compliance with our Helsinki commitments. In that spirit, I find it necessary to speak out against the congressional hearing chaired by Congressional Congressman Peter King. Rather than constructively using the power of Congress to explore how we as a nation can use all of our tools at our disposal to prevent future terrorist attacks and defeat those individuals and groups who want to do us harm, this spectacle crossed the line and chipped away at the religious freedoms and civil liberties we hold so dearly. Radicalization may be the appropriate subject of a congressional hearing, but not when it's limited to one religion. When that is done, it sends the wrong message to the public and casts a religion with unfounded suspicions. Congressman King's hearing is part of a disturbing trend to demonize Muslims taking place in our country and abroad. Instead, we need to engage the Muslim community in the United States. A cookie-cutter approach to profile what a terrorist looks like will not work. As FBI Director Mueller recently testified in the Senate, during the past year, the threat of radicalization has evolved. A number of disruptions occurred involving extremists from a diverse set of backgrounds, geographic locations, life experiences, and motivating factors that propel them along their separate radicalization pathways. Let us remember that a number of terrorist attacks have been prevented or disrupted due to the informants from the Muslim community who contacted law enforcement officials. I commend Attorney General Holder and FBI Director Mueller for increasing their outreach to the Arab American community. As Attorney General Holder said, and I quote, let us not forget it was a Muslim American who first alerted the New York police to a smoking car in Times Square, and his vigilance likely helped to save lives. He did his part to avert tragedy just as millions of other Arab Americans are doing their parts and proudly fulfilling the responsibility of citizenship. We need to encourage this type of cooperation between our government and law enforcement agencies in the Muslim community. As the threat from, as the threat from Al Qaeda changes and evolves over time, the piece of the puzzle is even more important to get right. FBI Director Mueller testified before the House recently that, and I quote, at every opportunity, I have and reaffirm the fact that 99.9% .9 of the Muslim Americans, Sikh Americans, and Arab Americans are every bit as patriotic as anyone else in this room, 
and that many of our anti-terrorist cases are as a result of the cooperation from the Muslim community and the United States. As leaders in Congress, we must live up to our nation's highest ideals and protect civil liberties, even in wartime when they are most challenged. The 9-11 Commission summed up this, up this well when they wrote, I quote, the terrorists have used our open society against us. In wartime, government calls for greater powers, and then the needs for these powers recede after the war ends. The struggle will go on. Therefore, while protecting our homeland, Americans must be mindful of threats to vital personal and civil liberties. This balancing is not easy to task, but we must constantly strive to keep it right. I agree with Attorney General Holder's recent speech to the Arab American anti discrimination Committee, where he stated that, in this nation, our many faiths, origins, and appearances must bind us together, not break us apart. In this nation, the document that sets forth the supreme law of the land, the Constitution, is meant to empower, not exclude. And in this nation, security and liberty are at their best partners, not enemies, ensuring safety and opportunity for all. Actions like the hearing held last week that pit us against one another based on our religion and belief weaken our country and its freedoms and ultimately do nothing to make our country any safer. Hearings like the one held last week only serve as a distraction from our real goals and provide fuel for those who are looking for excuses to find fault or blame in our way of life. Let us not go the way of other countries, but instead hold dear the protections in our Constitution that safeguard the individual right to freely practice their religion and forbid a religious test to hold public office in the United States. Our country's strength lies in its diversity and our ability to have strongly held beliefs and different opinions while being able to speak freely and not fear that the government will imprison you for criticizing the government or holding a religious belief that is not shared by a majority of Americans. On September the 11th, 2001, our country was attacked by terrorists in a way we thought impossible. Thousands of innocent men, women, and children of all races, religions, and backgrounds were murdered. As the 10-year anniversary of these attacks draw closer, we continue to hold these innocent victims in our thoughts and prayers, and we will continue to fight terrorism and bring terrorists to justice. After that attack, I went back to my congressional district in Maryland at that time and made three visits as a congressman. First, I visited a synagogue and prayed with the community. Then I visited a mosque and prayed with the community. And then I went to a church and prayed with the community. My message is clear on that day. We all needed to join together as a nation to condemn the terrorist attacks and to take all necessary measures to eliminate safe havens for terrorists and to bring them to justice. We all stood together on that day, regardless of our background or personal beliefs. But my other message was, was equally important. We cannot allow the events of September the 11th to demonize a particular community, religion, or creed. Such actions as McCarthyism harken back to darker days in our history. National security concerns were used inappropriately with, and led to 120,000 Japanese Americans to be stripped of their property and rights and placed in internment camps in 1942, though not a single act of espionage was ever established. The United States should not carry out a crusade against any particular religion as a response to 9-11 or terrorist attacks. The United States will not tolerate hate crimes against any group, regardless of their religion or ethnicity, and we should not allow our institutions, including Congress, to be used to foment intolerance and injustice. Let us come together as a nation and move forward in a more constructive and hopeful manner. With that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor. Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. President. I understand that uh, Senator uh, Inhofe and Senator Vitter are both on the floor to offer uh, amendments to the SBIR and STTR program. Are we under a consent agreement? We are not. Okay. I, okay. Yes. I yield to Senator Inhofe. Yes, the pending amendment. The Amendment is Amendment Number 183. Uh, I would ask uh, unanimous consent that it be temporarily set aside for the purpose of uh, introducing, uh, I guess, Senate one, Amendment 161, 178. Oh. Oh. Okay. Right. Let me Senate, 
Maybe. Senator Vitter was here. That's why I wanted to say he wanted the opportunity to offer his. It doesn't matter to me in what order. All right. Why don't we just I ask you to consent that he be recognized for his amendment and set aside our amendment temporarily, and then we'll get Senator Johan's amendment after that. Okay. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President. Senator, Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. President, and thanks to my colleagues for their courtesies and cooperation. And at this point, Mr. President, I do move to temporarily set aside the pending amendment and to call up bitter amendment number 178. Is there objection? Without objection, sir. Clerk will report. The Senator from Louisiana, Mr. Mr. President, I ask to waive reading of the whole. Without objection, Mr. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, right uh, before lunch, I laid the groundwork for this amendment, so let me quickly summarize. This is a series of amendments that our conservatives are bringing to the floor that go to our central challenge of reining in uncontrolled spending and debt. Uh, Mr. President, clearly we face a monumental challenge in this country from the fact that we are on an unsustainable path right now of federal spending and debt. And clearly this endangers our future. We're used to talking, it as, talking about it as a threat to our kids and grandkids, something that will come home to roost years from now. Mr. President, sadly, in the last several years, it has grown to much more than that. It is such an unsustainable path that it yields the possibility of a crisis within weeks or months or a couple of years. And so we cannot kick the can down the road. We cannot fail to act now. We must change the fiscal path we're on to protect not just future generations, but our country as we know it right now. And so in that spirit, a number of fiscal conservatives are coming to the floor to offer spending and debt amendments, and I'm honored to be associated with, with that group. You'll see other senators come down, Senators Cor Cornyn and Rubio, Senators DeMint and Paul and others with other spending and debt amendments. Amendment number 178, Mr. President, is a very simple, straightforward idea. It would mandate that the federal government in an orderly way begin to get rid of billions and billions of unused or underused federal property. Mr. President, there have been many studies on this topic. They all come to the same bottom line, which is that the federal government owns many tens of billions of unused or underused federal property that is not only not only represents assets that could be liquidated to yield money to the federal treasury, but as long as we hold on to it as a federal government, it represents enormous ongoing cost to simply maintain and deal with this unused federal property. Um, the Office of Management and Budget says there are over 46,000 underutilized properties, but almost 19,000 completely unused properties. Estimated value between the two categories, $83 billion. That could be liquidated, that money brought to the Treasury, but also in the, in the meantime, if we don't do that, that's actually costing us money in terms of upkeep, mowing the grass, if you will, and a lot more other and expensive upkeep. So this amendment, Mr. President, is very simple and straightforward to require the federal government to sell off or demolish this property and help contribute in a limited way, but an important way, to get us on a different, more sustainable fiscal path. Again, Mr. President, I commend this amendment to all of my colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, and I also say that it is part of a broader effort on this bill, on other bills, I'm sure, in the future, to get us on a different fiscal path. And we'll be seeing today in the next few days Senators Corn and then DeMint, Rubio, Rand Paul, others coming to the floor with this set of fiscal amendments to nudge, push, pull, anything we can do, this body and the Congress, in this important direction before it's too late. Thank you, Mr. President. With that, I yield the floor. 
Mr. President, let me just uh, add a word. I see the Senator from Oklahoma, but again, as the manager of this bill, Senator Snow and I have worked across uh, party lines to bring the SBIR bill to the floor. We want to have as open an, an amendment process as possible. Uh, we think that is fair. We'd like to really ask uh, people to focus on amendments specific to this legislation. And I know that time on the Senate floor is precious, and we don't get as much time as we would like to offer our bills and amendments. But we do ask everyone so that we can try to get this bill to the House and hopefully to the President's desk. But Senator Inhofe is here to offer an amendment, and we agreed earlier to allow that to happen. So I'll turn the floor over to him. The senator from Oklahoma is recognized. I thank the senator from uh, Louisiana managing the bill. Uh, first of all, we are currently on, uh, my understanding, amendment number 183. I'd like to set aside the current amendment for consideration of amendment 161 by Senator Johans and ask for its consideration. Is there objection? Was there objection so ordered? Clerk will report. The Senator from Oklahoma, Mr. Inhofe, for Mr. Johans, proposes an amendment numbered 161. At the end, add the following. Title VI. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to dismiss with the reading. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent to return to the underlying amendment uh, number 183. No objection. So ordered. Thank you. Uh, and I, again, I thank the Senator from Louisiana. I've <clears throat> This is the uh, amendment to the underlying bill. It's a, uh, a very significant one. To give a little background, uh, Mr. President, for the last nine years, I've had uh, an effort to stop a legislation called cap and trade legislation. Uh, it's, it's one that I think everyone now, no one used to hear of it, but everyone's familiar with it now after these nine years. It goes all the way back to the Kyoto Treaty. And then people realized at that time that we were not, in the Clinton administration, we were not going to ratify that treaty. In fact, the uh, President Clinton never even brought it up for ratification. But people realized that this would be something that would be very, very expensive for America. So after that, in uh, 2003 and 2008, 2005 and, and on up, there are about uh, seven different times that members of the Senate brought up a cap and trade legislation. Uh, it was 19, 2003 when the um, MIT and the Wharton School came out with uh, analyses of what it would cost to do a cap and trade bill, the amount always ranged between 300 and 400 billion dollars a year. Now I quite often say when you're talking about billions and billions of dollars, you have to bring this home so people understand what we're talking about. In this case, in my state of Oklahoma, uh, this would equate to something a little bit over $3,000 for every family every family that uh, 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 files a tax return. Now, the reason I bring this up at this time is that they tried to pass this uh, all throughout the years. The last one, I think, was the, the um, Waxman-Markey bill over in the House that came over to the Senate. And of course, they didn't have near the votes to pass it over here. I think the most votes they could have gotten at any time in the Senate to pass a cap-and-trade bill was about 30 votes. Obviously, that's not enough. So. This administration decided since they won't do it legislatively, we will do what they wouldn't do legislatively uh, through, uh, through regulations. And that's where the Environmental Protection Agency came along. And of course, uh, I, back when Republicans were a majority, I was the chairman of the Environment and Public Works Committee. Now it's Senator Boxer from California, and I'm the ranking member. So we have jurisdiction over the, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. And I think it's very important that we draw this in and make the, connect the dots and let people realize that what we're talking about now. There's a great concern in this country about the price of gas at the pumps. It is approaching uh, vastly at $4 uh, a gallon. And uh, this is something that is a, a great concern to my wife and to everybody else I know in my state of Oklahoma. And uh, the problem that we have is a problem that is a bureaucratic problem. It's a, it's a problem that uh, this administration uh, are not allowing us to exploit reserves that we have in this country. We have, but that we have only 28 billion barrels of proven reserves 
and and that isn't enough to to really provide for our own uh, our own consumption here in this country. But I ask you now to go to the CRS report. This is about a year ago, less than a year ago. Uh, Senator Murkowski and I requested a CRS report, uh, Congressional um, Review Report, and they came out and said that it would be that right now the United States of America has um, more oil, gas, and coal reserves than any other country in the nation. Let's take first the coal reserves. Now, this is what they're talking about in. Uh, okay, the oil reserve. This is the uh, proven reserves here. The problem with using the, the, the word proven instead of, uh, in, instead of recoverable is that you can't use proven. A proven one has to be a result of drilling. In other words, you have to drill and you know it's there, so it comes up, well, that proves it. Well, obviously, if we have obstacles so that this, the, uh, the majority of people, uh, along with the administration, doesn't want us to drill offshore, doesn't want to dr us to drill on public lands, and you can't get in there and, and, uh, and prove it, then we have to go back and uh, take the recoverable thing. And this is what all of the geologists, everyone says that we have in this country. No one has refuted this, I might add. So instead of being $28 billion, uh, 28 billion barrels, it's 135 uh, billion barrels of oil. Now, if you carry that further and you realize that that this report is is one that shows that clearly we could we could have these huge reserves. If you want to go on now to uh, the um, well, uh, to the. Um, uh, Oh, the, uh, to natural gas and see what this same CRS report said about natural gas. Let's put that, let's uh, put the, the chart that shows all three of them. What this shows is the combination of the uh, fossil fuels. That's gas, uh, coal, and oil. And this is the United States of America. Second is Russia, but it shows the United States has greater recoverable reserves than Saudi Arabia, China, uh, China, Iraq, and these countries all combined. So it's a huge reserve that's out there. In fact, our reserves of, uh, of oil that we're talking about, we have the equivalent to replace our imports for the Persian Gulf for more than 90 years. In other words, if we just lift the restrictions that we currently have placed on uh, drilling for oil, it'd be 90 years. On gas, it turns out to be just about the same thing. The, uh, based on the CRS report, it says that the 2009 assessment of the Potential Gas Committee, CRS states that America's future supply of natural gas is two, uh, uh, two uh, is 2,000 trillion. You're getting an awful lot of zeros in here. 2,000 trillion. At today's rate of use, this would be enough natural gas to meet America's demand for 90 years. The report also reveals the number of coal reserves. The coal reserves uh, are more than 28% uh, of the world's coal, coal. In fact, CRS cites America's recoverable coal reserves to be 262 billion short tons. For perspective, the United States just consumes 1.2 billion short tons uh, of coal per year. So that's 262, a major export opportunity for us, and, 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 uh, and as well as for jobs. So when we talk about our reserves that we have in oil, gas, and coal, there's a lot more out there, but this is just what we know is, is recoverable. For example, I did not include shale, oil and gas shale that's out there. The Green River Formation located in Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah contains the equivalent of six trillion barrels of oil. That's six trillion barrels of oil. The Department of Energy estimates that the, of the six trillion, approximately 1.38 trillion barrels are potentially recoverable. That's equivalent to more than five times the oil reserves of Saudi Arabia. Now, again, I didn't include these when I say we have enough to sustain us for, for 90 years. Another domestic energy source would be the methane hydrates. That's another one that has just a tremendous uh, uh, potential there. And while the estimates vary significantly, the United States Geological Service recently testified that the mean in-place gas hydrate resource for the entire United States is estimated at 320,000 trillion cubic feet of gas. Did I say that right? I think I did. 
for perspective, it's just, if just 3% of this resource can be commercialized in the years ahead at current rates of consumption, that level of supply would be enough to provide America natural gas for more than 400 years. But I didn't include that. So I'm only including what is recoverable and what is out there for more than 400 years. And that's what I call energy security. I guess we need to also realize that it's not just energy that we could do when you're talking about, uh, there's nothing more basic than supply and demand. And if we are stopping our supply of oil and gas in this country, then the demand's going to go up and we're gonna have to go elsewhere. If you wanna become independent, and we could become independent uh, if we were to uh, exploit our own resources. But we have other reports here that talk about the number of jobs that are at stake here. Only two deep water uh, well permits have been issued in the last 11 months. I thought at the time when we had the, the oil spill in the Gulf, there are going to be people that are around saying, aha, we're going to parlay this into stopping production, stopping uh, exploration. And uh, sure enough, they did. And so while the, the moratorium on the Gulf has been lifted, the um, only two deep water well permits have been issued in the last, uh, last 11 months. The delays in, in continuation of the current permitting pace could cost 125,000 jobs in uh, 2015. And getting down to the uh, developing the Alaska's offshore, for example, that would create 55,000 jobs a year. So we're talking about a lot of jobs. We're talking about a lot of uh, reasons that we should go ahead and pass this amendment. Now let's keep in mind what the amendment is. It's an amendment that would take away the jurisdiction from the Environmental Protection Agency to regulate greenhouse gases, anthropogenic gases, and, uh, and, and leave that as something that should be done, and, uh, it should be done by members of the, of, the, of the Senate and the House. Uh, Senator Baucus from uh, Montana said, I mentioned that I do not want the EPA writing those regulations. I think it's too much power in the hands of one single agency, but rather climate change should be a matter of essentially left to Congress. And that's what we're talking about. As we speak today, the House is marking up the bill. It's called the Upton Inhofe bill over there. Over here, it's called the Inhofe Upton bill. And that is to stop them from the, uh, the EPA from this regulation. Uh, Senator Nelson from, uh, from Nebraska said, controlling the levels of carbon emissions is the job of Congress. We don't need the EPA looking over Congress's shoulder telling us that we're not moving fast enough. Uh, we have some eight Democrat senators joining them saying that the EPA should not have the authority, doesn't have the authority and should not be doing it. We are talking about uh, such uh, as uh, senators as Senator uh, Baggage, uh, um, um, uh, Sherrod Brown, Bob Casey, Claire McCaskill, Carl Levin, and Max Baucus of Montana. So there seems to be a general, and that's the reason I, I feel optimistic that if we can get this amendment up for a vote, we're going to have a favorable vote on this thing. I know all the Republicans are going to vote for it, and I think that an awful lot of the Democrats are. I think when you're facing a situation where we have gas that's going so high, it's going to be, it's going to be very difficult to uh, not... Uh, not give serious consideration to this uh, to this amendment, and I would go further to say that we the um, the administration has been no help. I have the quote that I've used several times on the floor. Stephen Chu, who's Secretary of Energy, told the Wall Street Journal that somehow we have to figure out how to boost the price of gasoline to the levels in, uh, levels in Europe. Well, that's eight dollars a gallon. Now, what they're saying is that they want to make it, to do away with fossil fuels, and, uh, and before you can go to other forms of energy, you have to do that. In the meantime, how do we run this machine called America? You can't do it without oil, gas, and coal. So the bottom line is, we do have enough oil, gas, and coal to run this country. We could be independent from our reliance upon uh, the Middle East. Uh, it, uh, totally after a short period of time if we were to go in. Some people say, well, if you were to open up all of these places, it would be another five or six years uh, before we're going to be able to actually produce all of this oil and gas that we so desperately need in this country. But in, in, respond, in response to that, I say, uh, first of all, it won't be that long. And secondly, I heard that same argument five and six years ago, and if we'd done it then, we would be there today. 
So we have a very, we have a serious problem that's looming out there, and uh, I know that others want to come down. I know Senator Brasso. By the way, Senator Brasso has an amendment that is a different amendment than this, even though he's a co-sponsor of this amendment, uh, number 183. His would go into such things as NEPA, uh, the Endangered Species Act, and other things that the EPA is trying to use the regulation of greenhouse gases to change our lifestyle in America. So uh, that's where we are today, and with that, I would uh, yield the floor. The Senator from New York. I thank my colleague for his courtesy. I'm not speaking about this issue, but I appreciate I saw he looked over in this direction, so I was eager to speak, and I appreciate that. I'll be brief. Um, I rise today to speak about the current debate over the federal budget. Uh, as you know, Mr. President, last week, H.R. 1, the House Republican scorched earth spending proposal that counts among its casualties such priorities as border security, cancer research, disaster preparedness, and much needed investments in domestic energy production was summarily defeated in the Senate. That same day, a Democratic alternative that would have cut spending by $10 billion compared to current levels and $51 billion compared to the President's budget request was also defeated. We were hopeful that these failed votes would be an opportunity to start afresh. We thought they would allow us to hit the reset button on the negotiations. These, the purpose of those votes was to make it clear that both sides opening bids in this debate were non-starters and thus pave the way for a serious good faith compromise. But unfortunately, an intense ideological tail continues to wag the dog over in the House of Representatives. Because one week after those test votes failed here in the Senate, House conservatives are still showing no yield. We have moved $10 billion in their direction they haven't budged an inch off H.R. 1, even though H.R. 1 didn't get a single Democratic vote here on the floor of the Senate. In fact, the Republican conservatives in the House are digging in. In the last 48 hours, there's been a wave of hardliners who are now rejecting even the three-week stopgap measure negotiated last week. This measure is needed to avert a government shutdown this Friday. But in the vote occurring very shortly in the House, there is expected to be a number of right-wing defections on this short-term continuing resolution. Look, Democrats agree that this short-term solution is not ideal. Running the government two weeks at a time is not good for anyone. We'd prefer not to have to do another stopgap, but we recognize the need, the necessity, of averting a government shutdown. Throughout this debate, Democrats have shown a willingness to negotiate a willingness to meet Republicans in the middle. And yet, the rank and file of the House GOP has been utterly unrelenting. They've wrapped their arms around the discredited, reckless approach advanced by H.R. 1, and they won't let go. But why are House conservatives bucking their leadership by resisting even the stopgap measure? Well, it certainly can't be because it doesn't cut spending, because it does by another $6 billion over just three weeks. The real reason many of the House conservative Republicans, particularly the freshmen, the reason many of them oppose the stopgap CR is clear. It's because it doesn't contain the extraneous riders they demand. As you know, H.R. 1 was chock full of ideological policy measures. These items deal with controversial issues like abortion and global warming and net neutrality. They don't belong on a budget bill, but they were shoehorned onto it anyway. These measures are like a heavy anchor bogging down the budget negotiations. In recent days, a number of right-wing interest groups, the Heritage Foundation, the Family Research Council, began encouraging Republicans to vote against any budget measure that doesn't contain these controversial policy measures. This is what is driving the defections on the Republican side. For example, Mike Pence explained he's voting no because the three-week measure doesn't weigh in on abortion. He's the author of the controversial 
hard right amendment to defund Planned Parenthood. And yesterday, he said he wouldn't mind a government shutdown if it meant he could succeed in passing his rider. Michelle Bachman said she's voting no because the short term CR doesn't repeal the health care law. Tim Ulskamp, a freshman from Kansas on the Budget Committee, said he'd oppose the stopgap measure because it lacked riders against EPA and against family planning. We finally know why a compromise has been so hard to come by on the budget. Mr. President, it's because Republicans want more than spending cuts. They want to impose their entire social agenda on the back of a must-pass budget. They're entitled to their policy positions, but there is a time and place to debate these issues. And Mr. President, this ain't it. We've seen this type of overreach before. In the recent battle in Wisconsin, where, where Governor Scott Walker went to war with the state's public workers. Governor Walker started out seeking concessions from the unions on their benefits in order to reduce Wisconsin's budget shortfall. In a spirit of cooperation, unions agreed to reduce their benefits. But the governor didn't take yes for an answer. He went further and insisted on ending collective bargaining entirely. The budget fight going on right now in this chamber is also about more than just budget cuts. The conservative Republicans in the House are showing themselves to be Scott Walker Republicans. They are using the budget to try to shoot the moon on a wish list of far-right policy measures. If this debate were only about spending cuts, we'd probably come to an agreement before too long. But we will have a hard time coming to an agreement with these Scott Walker Republicans who are trying to use the budget to enact a far-right social agenda. I urge Speaker Boehner to consider the path to a solution to this year's budget that may not go through the Tea Party. He should consider moving on without them and forge a consensus among more moderate Republicans in a group of Democrats. Because if these extraneous policy items are going to be a must-have on the budget, a compromise will be very, very, very hard to come by. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from